Okay, so this Hecker category, this lecture is about Hecker category and Zergel biomodules. And this will be very much a kind of overview lecture. Um, we've given kind of extensive amounts of discussion of this in various places. So what's the motivation uh, if we consider just for a moment um, G is a um, finite group of Lie type and assume split, then we can consider this um, Hecker algebra And then, so this is just an algebra that a priori depends on G and, um, and Q. But what Iwahori noticed, so this is an, uh, this is an algebra over C. What Iwahori noticed and proved is that it has a presentation which is kind of independent of Q, where Q enters in a very minor way. And so we instead get an algebra over, over in our normalization ZVV inverse. And so why is this powerful? Because it allows us, so, and this, um, and it only depends on the vial group viewed as a Coxeta group. And this is um, very useful because we can kind of study Q, all Q at once. So we kind of isolate a part of the representation theory that is independent of Q and just looks like the representation theory of the vial group. And also the Hecker algebra makes sense for any Coxeta group whether or not this Coxeta group arises as the vial group of a of an um, reductive algebraic group. And the kind of main question that motivates at least the first hour today is can we do a similar thing for the Hecker category? In other words, this thing begins its life in a very concrete manifestation uh, coming out of in this case, a finite group of Lie type. And then we understand this better and we kind of free it from the environment in which it arose. So uh, remember in lecture 24, so this was this um, lecture called A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Hecker Category, where I described this iterative process through four, four iterations of arriving at a reasonable definition of the Hecker category. And so now we switch and G is a complex group and we arrived at the definition where we consider this additive category, which is semi-simple complexes inside the B equivariant derived category of the B times B equivariant derived category of G. Let's say for this lecture, I'll always take C coefficients. Um, and this is monoidal.
which is a consequence of the decomposition theorem. And then we defined our final definition of the Hecker category was as the homotopy category of this category. And I tried to argue that this thing, even though it looks a little bit artificial, it kind of has a motivic nature in that it specializes to all the different possible manifestations of the Hecker category. And so a more precise quest, a more precise variant of the question above is can we present? So the Iwahori description of the Hecker algebra is a presentation of the Hecker algebra. So can we present H or H semi-simple by generators and relations? Um, does H make sense for any Coxeter system? Um, and one kind of immediate motivation for this is the fact that we can so this was something that Masood asked about. We can give um, similar definitions to this bit here using, for example, G over an algebraically closed field of positive characteristic and a tile sheaves. how to compare. So a priori, it seems like a kind of hopeless task to prepare to, to compare these Hecker categories defined in different contexts. Okay, so now uh, this is the first bit at which you might want to go and get a cup of tea. I just want to um, briefly go over equivariant cohomology um, very briefly and equivariant cohomology with tori and the Borel description. Okay, but I hope the questions should make sense. So what we will see is that they are answered to kind of half, you get half the way to an answer, answer of these questions via Zogel bimodules. Um, and we get the full way by um, a diagrammatic description of this category. But most of this lecture will be about Zogel bimodules, but in order to discuss Zogel bimodules, I need to recall a little bit about equivariant cohomology because I think this will be unfamiliar to some people here. Are there any philosophical questions before I begin? Or even non-philosophical questions? Okay, equivariant cohomology. Uh, so we have some gr group acting on a space. I'm generally thinking that X is an algebraic variety and K is an um, algebraic group. Then we define the equivariant cohomology of X. I mean, one definition is as the cohomology of the so-called Borel construction. This is the Borel construction. Um, and so EK is a classifying space. Okay. Uh, so this is a connected contractible space upon which K acts freely. And we have this map
So in, not, in spaces, you always have the map to a point. In um, equivariant cohomology, you ha always have the map to, um, this is kind of like point mod k. So what that tells us is that the um, equivariant cohomology of x is a graded module or even graded algebra over the equivariant cohomology of a point. So the equivariant derived category, whatever it is, it, it, I mean, you can think about it as kind of a setting um, for the normal, the normal derived category is a setting for cohomology and the equivariant derived category is a setting for equivariant cohomology. And so given F in dBk of x, then the cohomology of x with coefficients in the k equivariant cohomology of x with coefficients in k is a graded module. over the equivariant cohomology of a point. Okay. So the moral is that in equivariant land, everything is a module over the equivariant cohomology of a point. Just as in ordinary land, everything is a module over the cohomology of a point, but in ordinary land, the cohomology of a point is not very interesting. But in equivariant land, it is. Um, so what's um, equivariant cohomology for tori? Firstly, if T is C star, then a choice for E C star, we can take C infinity without zero. So remember that E K is only defined up to equivariant homotopy. Okay, so for example, if we took, so here's one possible version of E C star, but we could also take the product of this with itself and get another one for example. Um, so by formally, I guess I mean, this is the direct limit of C to the N without zero. And we had a discussion, um, lunch discussion a few months ago about ways of seeing that this is in fact contractible. Uh, so the C, C star equivariant cohomology of a point is the point times c star c infinity without zero, which is the cohomology of p infinity, which is a polynomial ring in one variable where this degree is two of this variable. Okay. And also in this particular case, this generator is completely canonical um, as the fundamental class of P1 inside P infinity. Uh, and similarly, if um, T is C to start to the N, then we can take ET to be C infinity without zero to the N and then the T equivariant cohomology of a point is the cohomology of N copies of P infinity, which is the a polynomial ring in N variables. But now these variables really correspond to the fact that I've chosen this isomorphism. So one thing that struck me as entirely unnecessary when I started this, I, I never understood why people want to make kind of canonical choices. Um, so this was kind of mysterious when I was a graduate student, but it's kind of when, when we're confronted with a torus, we would like a description of the equivariant cohomology ring that doesn't involve choosing such an isomorphism. Uh, and we can do this 
So a more canonical description, this is Borel's description. Is that if we have a character of our torus, we get a line bundle, a C star bundle, which is C star times over the torus and this character with ET over point mod T. ET, this is a C star bundle. And now um, the map from the characters, so this is the characters of. of t, so this we could call the Borel map, that sends a character to the churn class of this bundle, so this sends um, Right here. This is an isomorphism as you can readily check by choosing a basis, by choosing an isomorphism of your torus with C star to the N. But this is really nice because it doesn't involve any, sorry, this should be the. C1 of L chi. So this doesn't involve any choice of, we have a canonical isomorphism uh, with H2, and so we get that the symmetric algebra on chi, let's say over C, is isomorphic to the T equivalent homology of a point with C coefficients. So this is often called the Borel isomorphism. Uh, and over C, it's probably, there's, an, there's another way of thinking about this, um, which is perhaps useful. Which is that uh, if we're given a character of our torus, we can differentiate it and get a, a linear function on the Lie algebra. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure. So in your uh, isomorphism between uh, uh, chi and H2T of a point, uh, the coefficient on the right hand side is dead, right? Yeah, thank you, I meant to. Uh, and we can rephrase the Borel isomorphism as being uh, an isomorphism between the regular functions on the Lie algebra and the T equivalent homology of a point with C coefficients. Okay. And this is the version that we'll use today. Okay, and just um, just a remark. Uh, So I guess I'm kind of hoping that you've seen some kind of equivariant homology before, and then I'm just kind of reminding you of some things. Um, useful trick is that uh, if I have a subgroup So in the theory of Lie groups, the subgroup is always, it acts freely on the group itself. And so this says 
on, on the on the um, ambient group. And so what this tells us is that we can take so any model of eg is also a model of ek via restriction okay so if you give me an eg then we also have an ek a classifying space for Okay, so two examples of this phenomenon. So this is why I'm discussing it because we want to, the passage between B and T will be important. So if we take an EB and mod out T, mod out B, so this is a B mod T is isomorphic to C to the N bundle. And so this implies that these two spaces are homotopic. So this implies that the B equivariant cohomology of a point is canonically isomorphic to the T equivariant cohomology of a point. So this is a general fact that you can always throw away unipotent subgroups in equivariant cohomology, or you can quotient by unipotent subgroups in equivariant cohomology. Two, uh, I won't prove this, but if we look at EG mod T going to EG mod G, then this induces a map from the G equivariant cohomology of a point to the T equivariant cohomology of a point and theorem um, P star is injective and the image is those functions on the Lie algebra of T which are in W invariant. And this is an instance of what's called abelianization in equivariant cohomology, which is that you can generally, as a general rule, you can reduce things to the torus pretty quickly. So this tells us that the equivariant cohomology ring is described in an easy way as some invariance in terms of the equivariant cohomology of the torus. So Jordi, maybe a comment for students. Um, if I'm not wrong, then what you were saying before about different choices of isomorphism between, let's, let's say take G equals GLN, different choice of isomorphisms of the torus with C star to the N, then it amounts to in this theorem of which basis of symmetric function you want to take. Is that reasonable? I mean, I would say that symmetric functions live here, whereas the choice that I was making before is kind of more basic. It's more like, you know, a basis for a vector space. Uh -huh. Okay, so the point is that equivariant cohomology of anything in the equivariant derived category is a module over the equivariant cohomology of a point. That's point number one. And the second point is that the equivariant cohomology of a point, things that come up have easy descriptions as some kind of polynomial rings or functions on vectors, polynomial functions on vector space. So, we're about to come to the most important theorem of this these two hours. So we have db b times bg. And what we can do is we can consider the functor of 
B times B equivariant hypercohomology. And what we land in is B times B point graded modules. But this by the discussion that we just had is the same thing as T times T point graded modules. And this is the same thing as R graded by modules. So I'm hoping that it's clear that this means graded modules. This is maybe less clear. This, so this is graded by modules. Where here R is the functions on the Lie algebra of T. So this is essentially a once we choose a basis for the Lie algebra, this is a polynomial ring. And so this this is a monoidal category. Uh, um, this is a monoidal category. This is also monoidal. So given two bimodules B and B prime, I'm just repeatedly saying that bimodules are a mono monoidal category. Okay, so and in inside this we have the category of semi-simple complexes. And as a general rule, you can think that cohomology doesn't see very much. You know, we've seen in previous lectures, we've seen various examples of interesting perverse sheaves on P1 that have no cohomology whatsoever. Um, and you know, I'm sure you've seen other examples of this. So taking cohomology is general, generally a very lossful operation. So the following theorem um, is remarkable, and I hope it also seems remarkable. So this is uh, Zergel's theorem. is that um, H, this functor of equivariant hypercohomology is fully faithful and monoidal on just so hence this category of semi-simple complexes admits an embedding inside graded R by modules. So um, I hesitated a little bit whether to go over um, how you prove this theorem. I decided not to, um, but I guess Anna's been wrestling with this. So if you would like to ask her about this, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but she might like to talk to you about it. Um, so how do we describe the image? Okay, so, um, yeah, this is, I might just copy this down because it's so, it's so important. Um, Okay, so inside this we have the semi-simple complexes and they hit something and the question is 
how do we describe this something? And basically the answer is that um, it is Zogel bimodules. And then you can say, uh, what are Zogel bimodules? And so that's what I wanted to find now. So the first observation, which is, so I guess the point is that the description of this image is rather soft in some sense. So H um, semi-simple is generated by ICS, which is just the constant sheaf on P, S, P, bar one, under um, convolution grading shift sums and sum ends. So, I mean, this is closely related to the fact that the Hecke algebra is generated by the delta S's or the TS's for S a simple reflection. And it's also closely related to the fact that bot samuelson resolutions exist. So a, con a convolution of copies of this ICS is essentially realizing the direct image of the constant sheaf from a bot samuelson resolution. So what a way of writing this in terms of formulas is that this is generated by ICS for S simple under the operations of convolution shifts, sums, and sum ends. Okay. So I'll recall that this is Zergel's lovely notation for sum ends. So it's a direct sum minus. Uh, so it, it follows immediately because this is a fully faithful functor that the image is SBIM, which is the image of these generators under the same operations. Except in Zogel bimodules, we usually denote the shift by the curly brackets. And here where BS is um, T times T equivariant hypercohomology of ICS. And it turns out that this has a very nice description. It's simply the tensor product of R with itself over the S invariants. Okay. Um, this is a, a decently doable exercise in equivariant cohomology, so. Okay, so. I mean, probably this is not a super enlightening definition, um, but it's definitely correct. Okay, so unpacking the definition. So unpacking. The theorem, this tells us that this functor of B times B equivariant hypercohomology from this category of semi simple complexes under, mo under convolution is an equivalence of, of monoidal categories with S BIM. And the tensor product. And I should have written in big letters that this is what people call Zogel bimodules.
So this is an equivalence. Monodal categories. Um, and then the full Hecke category was just defined to be the homotopy category. And so we get an equivalence of the full Hecke category with S bin. And this is also a monodal equivalence. Okay, so a remarkable consequence of this is that, um, so in the notes, I mean, so I'll write this, it's a little, I'm, I'm being a little bit, um, what do you call it? Um, I don't know what you call it, but you'll, you'll be able to, so. To define um, polemical, I guess, uh, we need we need G, we need B, we need um, hundreds of pages of thief sheaf theory. And we need the decomposition theorem. Also, we need to read Bernstein norms, etc. But to define S BIM, what do we need? We just need the Lie algebra of T together with its W action, so that we can take invariance, plus a bit of algebra. So it really is a remarkable um, simplification in just in terms of input. And also you can imagine that um, these objects on this side are rather difficult to calculate with, and we've definitely seen examples of how complicated these calculations can be even for Simple examples, um, whereas you, one can imagine that calculations probably on this side are, are still complicated, but probably you can do a lot more. Uh, okay, so that's that was that. And do you define, how do you define equivariant hypercomology of a complex of she's? Okay, so that's a good question. So. Basically, um, when I write equivariant derived category, um, you can think that every, all the sheaves are already on the Borel construction. So like the constant sheaf, when I write the constant sheaf X, this is actually doesn't live on X, it lives on the Borel construction of X. And all the push-pull function functors, et cetera, live on the Borel construction. That's what happens in Bernstein norms. Jordi, uh, sorry, I missed something. So in this uh, Zorga biomodule, where is the W invariance again? Um, the W, like, I, I need to have, I need to know W because I need to, can you see where I'm? Yeah. That's the reason I need to know W. So, um, like, an easy way of remembering this Borel theorem that you first mentioned was that, um, you know, when you look at uh, somehow uh, G invariance or G covariance, uh, then for reductive groups, you can restrict to T and you basically get, you know, the T stuff, but then with an extra W, right? That's sort yes, of, um, exactly. so can we, so that's sort of a, like, Chevalier's restriction where, you know, G invariant functions are G are like W invariant functions on T. Now, if you look at sort of your uh, fully faithful functor, uh, which you had somewhere an inclusion, 
um, I think you said something was yeah fully faithful. Right. Is there somehow a way of defining sort of a W action at the level of categories such that the invariance is the Zorgel bimodule? Is that somehow something one can make sense of? Um, not that I know how to do, no. I mean, I, I, I kind of think about Zorgel bimodules as more, they're something that kind of live on G, but they're more kind of T, T, T equivariant objects or B equivariant objects. Right. So you can ask like, for example, what's the unique object in Zogel bimodules that's kind of W equivariant? That's a reasonable thing to ask. Like what objects in Zogel bimodules are W equivariant? And it turns out that the answer is the unique thing is like the IC of the entire G. Mm -hmm. Which is like the Kajalinsic basis element for the longest element. Okay, so I mean, for my very naive thinking, I was trying to think of this inclusion as somehow a much more complicated version of, you know, the fact that G invariant functions include inside uh, functions on T. Yeah, I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's, that's a really not the right way of thinking about it, no. Uh -huh. Um, okay, so just some, a, a few remarks before we get our tea. Um, so I'll be brief. This is kind of can be seen. Um, so this is much more elementary. We still say that we generate it inside some ambient category, but it's, it's closer to a presentation. Um, and also, um, by replacing so I'm saying that this is by replacing um, Lee T with an appropriate reflection representation. So all we needed to define Zogel biomodules was this vector space together with a reflection representation of WS. Um, SBIM makes sense for any Coxeta group. And this idea was pursued by Zergel as, as, an, uh, as a proposal to prove the positivity of Kajalinsic polynomials. And that proposal was then carried out by um, Ben and myself. Um, but somehow um, there's a serious amount of kind of extra, extra stuff that needs, needs to be developed in order to make that proposal kind of come off. Um, so there's this kind of whole world of combinatorial Hodge theory. Um, so one of the main goals of this course, which unfortunately is, um, has not been fulfilled, but we've, I've done my best, is um, this affine Hecker category should be equivalent to some kind of coherent cheese. Um, and Zergel's theorem says 
that H always has a coherent description. Um, but it's not a, I, I mean, if you ask me what are Zergo biomodules for SL2, the only answer I can give you is that they're Zergo biomodules for SL2. You haven't seen them in mathematical nature somewhere else. Whereas one of the main points of kind of Roman's work in my, in my kind of coming from the point of view of Zergo biomodules is that if you say Zergo biomodules for an affine group, then that is something that has a name somewhere else, namely as some coherent cheese on a Steinberg variety. So the, um, so Bezrel Kavnikov's point that um, Zergel biomodules are known by another name in the affine case. And this is not at all to kind of diminish um, Bezra Kamnikov's point, because the fact that it's known by another name um, makes a whole lot of structure there apparent that's totally opaque in the, from the point of view of Zergel biomodules. But I just remember when I kind of understood this, this point of view on, on, on things, um, it was very helpful for me. Um, and three, um, so a generators and relations description of Zergel biomodules was obtained by Ben and I following earlier work of Elias Kovanov, Libidinsky, and uh, Elias, um, it uses language of planar diagrammatics. So roughly speaking, you can think of, you have the Hecker category, perhaps it's semi-simple it's semi -simple objects. You have this B times B equivariant hypercohomology, functor, and this lands you in Zergel biomodules. And this is kind of half the way there. And then what we construct is another arrow here from some kind of generators and relations. And so this, um, in some sense, fulfills the dream of having something presented entirely via generated relations, just as it's very useful to have um, generated relations for the Hecker algebra. Uh, okay, so after the break, um, I will go through some diagrammatics um, very, very quick. Um, as I mentioned to some of you, um, yeah, if you don't know the diagrammatics already, it might be tough to follow. Um, I just want to go towards a description so that you can see some of the Wakimoto um, sheaves and central complexes for um, affine SL2. Jordi, when I look at this paper of Bezrukovnikov, um, um, so he doesn't seem to refer to Zorgel's work. So are you saying that you're sort of proposing a different path for parts of the proof? Which uh, paper are you referring to? Uh, two geometric realization. This one? Yeah, this maybe, one. Maybe I'm wrong. I just. Um, I mean, so what is an absolutely key thing in here is Bezrel Kamnikov Yun. Uh huh. And the center of Bezrel Kamnikov Yun is Zergo biomodules. 
Okay. And I'm very surprised if he doesn't cite Sogol, but it could be the case. Yeah, that's really crazy. He doesn't cite Sogol. <laughs> so, um, so this, what you're outlining here is the same proof that he gave. Yeah. So he reduced things to Zorgel by module and then he found the Langlands dual description in that work. Um, so there's, there's a proof via, by Chris Dodd, um, a student of Roman, that much more closely just gives a monodal function to Zorgel by modules. Um, so this is not Roman's original proof. Um, so Roman's original proof is to go via kind of Archipod Bezrel Kamnikov that I've, that I've tried to explain, but then you need, um, more like more input from, um, monodromic sheaves. And this is the bit where Zogel by modules enter. Mm -hmm. So I don't mean, I, I just mean two as a kind of high level explanation of, of conceptually what's going on. I'm not, um, meaning two as a kind of path towards a proof. At some point, it should be a path towards a proof, but um, yeah, Thanks. if that makes sense. I mean, if you read Bezra Kamnikov Yun, then it's really clear that the um, central tool is Zogobar mm -hmm. So this fully faithfulness, how, how general is that? Like if you um, try to replace B with, you know, some other subgroup uh, like you or something? Uh, yeah, so if you replace B by U on one side, um, still true. Um, if you increase, if you go to from B to a bigger P, then it, of course it's still true. If you go to U on both sides, then it gets a bit tricky. And I hope maybe to discuss that next time a little bit. That's what Bezel Kamenikov Yun do. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of this uh, paper by Ginsburg, like perverse G's and C star actions. He exactly. Is this? That's the non equivariant version of this, the fully faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But that one only sort of depend on the ambient space having like the Bill and Mickey. Yeah. And does this stuff all work with, uh, I, I guess you're saying because background of. You use it like it works with any coefficients. Yeah, if you replace yeah if on if you replace ICs with parity sheaves, it works with any coefficients. Mm -hmm. And probably the correct, you know, at the end of the day, probably the correct definition of the of H semi simple is not as semi simple complexes, but as parity sheaves. But as I'm not so care I'm not really worried about mod p coefficients in this course. So the Ginsburg paper is an attempt um, to um, understand Zergel's proof of the. So Zergel proved that fully faithfulness in the case of a flag variety before Ginsburg, and then then the proof is not particularly enlightening. And then Ginsburg tried to find an enlightening proof. So do does this paper yield uh, another proof or? As you say, it's not equivariant. Uh, yeah, but I think it's probably fine. Um, yeah, I think you could use the same method. To, okay. You could use Ginsburg, but Ginsburg's method. Yeah. And the, the parity sheaf proof um, goes via Gin, a variant of Ginsburg's method rather than a variant of Zergel's method.
Okay, so I want to just go over um, BGK central sheaves for um, SL2. So maybe one way of thinking about this whole world is that uh, we've seen, so I, I gave this, I gave a lecture probably about eight lectures ago or something where I described how you calculate the, um, the image of the, um, of the central functor for SL2 on the natural representation. And, um, and it took about an hour and I think some people were quite lost. Um, and it really is very complicated. And this is the first interesting example you can do. And one of the powerful things that uh, Zergel Biomodules allows you to do is that even though you definitely still need to work, you can do more, um, more complicated examples. And if you're Ben Elias, you can do really complicated examples. Um, and if you're Geordie, you can watch him, you can watch Ben Elias do really complicated examples and it's still enjoyable. So we want to describe um, Z from rep SL2 to the Hecker category. So this would be the extended by generators relations. So the, so let's call this the left-hand side and this is the right-hand side. So the left-hand side is easy. So this is the um, temporally lieb category. So I learned this morning on Wikipedia that temporally, Neville Temperley passed away in 2017 at the age of 102. Um, so the objects in the Tempeli Lieb category are non-negative integers, the morphisms, I'm sure you've all seen this before, are crossing list matchings. And we have a unique kind of interesting relation with that the circle evaluates to minus two. Um, and the beautiful theorem is that the um, full subcategory generated by the tensor powers of the, if we let V equals C2 be the natural representation of SL2, then the full subcategory generated by the tensor powers of N inside rep SL2 is equivalent to um, temporally lead and because this category is equivalent to the additive Karubi envelope of this category, um, temporally lead, if we take the additive Karubi envelope, this is isomorphic to rep SL2. This is equivalent as a monoidal category to rep SL2. So this provides a generators and relations description of representations of SL2. Um, and there's a remark in the notes that I won't repeat, which is that this is a very useful description of the representation theory of SL2. So it kind of makes it clear that to give a functor from, to, to give a functor from rep SL2 to some monodal category is just the same thing as giving an object in your monodal category that is self-dual of dimension two. And you can also think a little bit where the minus two comes from, but I don't want to do that at the moment. So the right-hand side, this extended affine Hecker category is more complicated.
So I just want to go over that now. So we have the Hecker category for affine Hecker affine SL2. And so this categorifies H. And then we have the extended affine Hecker category, and this is categorified by H extended. And I first describe H. Okay. So basically H extended is just H together with a little automorphism. And similarly, the extended affine Hecker category is just the ordinary affine Hecker category with a, with a little automorphism. So to define we need a something that we call a realization which in this case just boils down to h the c vector space together with so remember that in this case w is just generated by two simple reflections s and t and this is the finite simple reflection so we need a c vector space we need roots and co-roots And the only condition um, such that they pair to give the Cartel matrix. Oops. And actually, we could relax the condition on the off-diagonal entry, um, and we would still get a realization. The off-diagonal entry can, in fact, be whatever we, anything, and the theory will still work. Um, the most important choices. So there's just some tiny little um, interesting point here that I want to emphasize with. So remember where in the geometric settings this comes from uh, basically the the equivariant cohomology of a point or the Lie algebra of the torus. So the first one is that we just take H to be a one dimensional vector space and we take alpha S equals minus alpha T and alpha check S equals minus alpha T check. And this um, this realizes the and B would be H loop, which is C, um, where H loop where um, H loop star is spanned by alpha S and delta and um, alpha T is uh, minus alpha S plus delta alpha check, S check is uh, yeah, so I won't go into what um, alpha S check is, but we get the following picture. So here's alpha T.
So these are the roots in stuff. And a remark um, that's important for what follows is that H arises from the Iwahori and H loop arises from the Iwahori <coughs> semi-direct product C star where this is loop rotation. So in the theory of loop groups, we can either just take um, kind of Laurent polynomials, or we can centrally extend, or we can add loop rotation. And the central extension doesn't affect the realization at all. But whether we add the loop rotation or not is important. In the first case, we just, we get, um, so this is, case A, and this is case B. I guess the most important thing to, uh, to remember in order to get the punchline in a few slides is that this kind of, this delta corresponds to loop rotation. So once we fix this realization, then we can produce the monoidal category. So this is like, this is the input that goes into the diagrammatics. H arising from um, Yeah, I mean, that yeah, that H is the Lie algebra. Lie algebra of the maximal of the maximal reductive quotient. Of I. So essentially I is just a, a C star plus a whole lot of unipotent, a unipotent ocean. I mean, we get rid of that ocean, we just get C star, and when we take a Lie, it's Lie algebra, we get something one dimensional. Whereas if we add this extra Lie, this extra loop rotation, then when we, when we take the Lie algebra, we get something two dimensional. Okay, so now um, we come to the diagrammatics. So H, BS, so that stands for Botts Hamilton, is the monoidal category generated by two objects, which I call BS and BT. And then Morphisms are isotopy classes of planar diagrams with local generators. So whenever I draw a little dash circle, this means a local part of my diagram. So this is what I'm allowed to build my diagrams out of. I'm allowed to have a trivalent vertex, a dot, or a polynomial. And these have degrees, degree minus one, 
degree plus one, and degree equals the degree of F, where F is in R, which is the symmetric algebra on H star. Okay, so in this case, it's either a polynomial ring in one or two variables. It's either a polynomial ring in alpha s or it's a polynomial ring in alpha s and delta. Um, and then we have a whole barrage. It should be homogeneous, correct. We have a whole barrage of, um, of relations. Um, so I'll list what I think are, are all of them, but I'll definitely have forgotten some. And so I write most, most important here so that um, later on when someone complains that I'm missing one, I can say, well, I said most important. Um, I don't think anybody can um, disagree with these relations so far. Okay, so now um, I'll just write S. So these relations are intended to be understood with either color, but if I change to the other color, I should have the corresponding um, simple reflection here. So this is a polynomial slide relation. I have the relation that this is called the barbell relation. Two color associativity. No, that's not two color associativity, that's just associativity. It's a needle relation. And here, um, delta S of F is F minus S. Okay, so um, like as I've said a number of times, I, this is I said, pr pretty much probably impossible to follow if you haven't seen this business before, but here's an example of a morphism When you draw examples of morphisms, it's kind of difficult to make them non-zero, but this one I think is non-zero. This is a morphism. From uh, B, S, so you read along the bottom. So these diagrams are read from the bottom to the top. This is a morphism from B, S, B, T, B, T. B S B T B S B T two B T B S B T and maybe I can put another barbell somewhere. Okay, so these morphisms are beautiful little th looking things, and um, and you can have a lot of fun playing with them. Um, and also, yeah, it's this world of planar algebra where um, there's some pretty non-trivial structure that emerges only after calculating rather a lot. Um, and then the process is that we take this category. 
So this is enriched in in graded vector spaces. And now there's a process, it's actually an instance of de-equivariantization, but that might not be obvious, or equivariantization, where we view this, um, so given any graded category, I can produce a category with shift in which I formally add shifts of all my objects, but I only allow degree zero maps. So here I formally add shifts. Um, and then we only take degree zero maps. And then to that category, I take the, I formally add sum and, sums and sum ends. Formally adding sums is easy, you know, like morphisms between a sum of two objects is just a matrix. And formally adding sum ends is the Kirby envelope construction. And sum ends. And this produces me a category which I'll call um, semi simple diagrammatic. And then the theorem, which in the case of affine SL2 is not too hard, and in general um, is not particularly easy for me. So this is something that Ben and I worked on for a number of years, is that this semi-simple diagrammatic category is equivalent to Zergel bimodules, and that's in turn equivalent to semi-simple complexes. And the corollary is that um, the homotopy category of this diagrammatic category is isomorphic to H. And this is a place where calculations are maybe not so easy, but also doable. And finally, how do we get um, H extended? So we add a new generator. Object Omega. And this um, corresponding to the non trivial length zero element. And I'll denote the identity on this omega like this. And then we have new morphisms. So this green is a magical thing that turns um, red into blue and blue into green. Re sorry, red into blue and blue into red. This should be familiar. This, this is a kind of categorification of the fact that moving omega past a delta s applies the corresponding automorphism of the um, Dinkin diagram. And then we have relations.
So this is saying that this object, so this is this object here is omega squared. This is a map from the identity to omega squared back to the identity. And this is saying that this map is an isomorphism. So omega squared is isomorphic to the identity. And then we have another relation. That roughly speaking tells us that if we move omega past, um, past to BS and back. I mean, so yeah, this is, this is telling us that these two maps should be, these two, this relation is telling us that these two maps are mutually inverse isomorphisms. And there's a few more, but I, I think you get the picture. Ah, there's one, probably one more important one that I shouldn't forget. I have a tendency to neglect polynomials, which is bad. So I can slide a polynomial across this green line at the expense of applying the corresponding automorphism. So omega sends alpha s to alpha t and alpha t to alpha s. Okay. I realize this is reasonably um, fast paced. Um, are there any questions? Jordi, I have a question. Sure. Um, in the theorem um, that you quoted attributed to Ben and yourself, the, um, you need some assumption on the realization for... Um, yeah, so let's just know. say in this particular example, let's say use using H loop. But then there's another theorem um, of Rish and myself that tells us that H diag semi-simple is always equivalent to the semi -simple. So, so what Anthony is asking about is the fact that, so for example, if we take, um, so this, this issue shows up for affine groups and it also shows up in the mod P world that sometimes this underlying reflection representation is degenerate. So in this example of, of H for the affine group, the representation is not faithful. And basically um, what happens there is that this Zergel biomodule world breaks down. And initially um, Ben and I kind of phrased everything in terms of Zergel biomodules. So if the middle breaks, then we've lost our route across here. But once you have the generators and relations, then you can check that you have a functor to a geometric setting, um, which doesn't pass through here. And, um, and you get this. So this theorem should be understood that whenever the realization occurs, um, underlies some geometric setting, you have such an equivalence. Okay, so I just want to go over very briefly what um, Wakimoto complexes look like and things like that. So what we, we're aiming to do now is translate things that we've seen in the previous lectures into this world of Zogel biomodules or into, di into diagrammatic Zogel biomodules. So we've first seen the braid group categorification So in this language, this delta S, but S a simple reflection, corresponds to a complex Okay, so now my differentials are, are diagrams. And also 
whenever I draw these complexes, I'll, I'll follow a convention of Ben, which is to draw a double line, underline under degree zero. Yep. So it's very important in these diagrams to remember where you are in terms of homological shift. And this notation is a very convenient way of doing so. Um, delta W goes to something like a, something called a Rukia complex. which has um, many intriguing properties and we could talk about for several weeks. Uh, but just so if you've heard the word Rukia complex, you know where to put these things in. So this is really a W. Um, and delta omega, this is a length zero element, just goes to omega in degree zero. So it just acts as an automorphism. So um, recall that in our normalizations from previous lectures, the translation in the extended affine bile group by the first fundamental weight was um, T, this is our affine simple reflection, times omega. So this tells us that a wacky moto sheaf t pi one is just the corresponding Rukier complex t omega, which is b t omega omega one, where the differential is given by. Whoops, I think, um, oh, that's right. So T is red, yeah. So this is my first wacky moto complex. And now we can have some fun and square this wacky moto complex to get the wacky moto complex corresponding to twice the fundamental root. And I won't provide all details of these calculations, um, but it's really um, funny just to see the kind of this very elaborate theory um, kind of working. Um, so in degree zero, so what does this complex look like? So it's, it's the square, it's the square of this complex. So we get BT BT omega BT omega goes to BT omega omega one omega one BT omega goes to Here I'm just tensoring BT omega on the left. And so here's my, the complex from before. And then I'm tensoring omega one on the left. And I get some differentials. And just to be completely explicit, I'll say what these differentials are in this case. And then um, I might stop providing the differentials in a second. So this is the identity on omega. Sorry, the identity on BT, the identity on omega. This is the other way around.
There's a question in the chat. Correct. And then by using the relations, so basically BT omega moves past, sorry, omega moves past um, BT to produce BS and omega squares to the identity. And so you can see that this complex is in fact isomorphic to BT, BS, BT, BS, unit shift of BT. And the differential is uh, And now um, I'll just leave it as an exercise to calculate a few more of these. So J3 omega, sorry, J3 pi one is um, B T S T. Omega B S T Omega B T S Omega and um, J minus Pi one is a uh, So these calculations will be useful in a second. So now we consider the following thing. So the claim is that this is essentially a Wakimoto, uh, essentially a central complex. Which is the following thing it's not yet a complex, as we'll see in a second. Now the really funny thing that happens here is that note that d squared um, if we go d squared here then this is equal to which is the sum of the two simple, simple roots. So this is zero in H in the non-loopy one, and it's delta in the loopy one. And this is um, 
this is a shadow of the monodromy action on nearby cycles. This is a shadow of monodromy action. If you think about what delta does, it's about rotating the, the loop parameter. And rotating that loop parameter is exactly where monodromy comes from. Okay. So this is only a complex. In H realization. So I remember at some point in Boston when Ben and I realized that you needed to take this smaller, um, smaller realization, and I, I don't know, I was just extremely happy. Um, so now, uh, five more minutes. So, FBS. This is BS minus one. Goes to BSBS plus BT. BS1, and this is isomorphic to BS1 plus BS minus 1. And you can imagine that in a perfect world, this would cancel against this, and this would cancel against this. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. So this is isomorphic simply to, uh, so what did I do here? F times BS. So this is isomorphic to BTBS in degree zero. And similarly, FBT is isomorphic to BSBT. BSF is isomorphic to BSBT. BTF. So this is kind of central, like it's starting to look like it's central up to an automorphism, up to the up to the omega automorphism. And the theorem of Elias is that Z one is defined to be this complex times omega um, has a con canonical central structure. So here I'm, I'm just checking that this commutes past things up to isomorphism. But the claim is that there's actually a map in the homotopy category that realizes isomorphism and that these morphisms commute with all the other morphisms in my category. So there's an awful, awful amount of stuff to check here. Um, and moreover, there exists maps from the unit to Z1, Z1, and from Z1, Z1 to the unit, satisfying the temporary lead. Relations. And so the end result is a, that we have this desired tensor functor from SL2 to H extended. And um, I just want to show you some examples from the notes. So the first example um, here, this is the complex that we just wrote down. So this is F omega. And you can see that you can, it's kind of wacky moto filtration is manifest. So this is a wacky moto sheaf, and this is a wacky moto sheaf. And this is not a direct sum of complexes. The differentials mix up these two. 
but this is an extension of these two wacky moto sheets. And, and these weights are precise to the weights in the natural representation. And now you can have fun and square this thing. So, you know, I had my fun at about eight o'clock this morning when I squared this thing and I get this big, big complex. And now, um, because Ben's carefully done all the calculations, I can just assert that this BT, BT that splits up as, as a sh one shift and a minus one shift cancels precisely against these terms over here. And similarly with these ones. And so what we're left with is that this, comp this complex and moreover, this complex splits as a direct sum of something that I'm going to call Z3 and a copy of the unit. And this is, um, what's going on here is, is, of course, we have a tensor functor and therefore the fact that the natural representation of SL2 splits up as a three-dimensional plus a trivial is the, the value of the central functor on the three-dimensional and here's the value on the trivial module. And then um, in this particular case, you can see very nicely also the wacky moto filtration. So the wacky moto filtration has three layers. Here's my J2 wacky moto, which we calculated before. Here's my J0 wacky moto. Here's my J minus two. And again, minus two, zero, and two are exactly the weights in the three dimensional representation. And um, with a little bit more work, you can use this delta to also produce the um, monodromy endomorphism. Great. So um, as I said last week, um, there will be one more lecture where I'll try to um, give an overview of uh, Bezel kamnikov yun and, um, and some of the pieces of Bezel kamnikovs proof of the um, full equivalence. And then we will have a break. Um, so thanks.